can you really protect your home and its contents from an electromagnetic pulse? The answer lies somewhere between no to maybe somewhat in some circumstances, depending on a lot of variables. We're, we're going to go all into that. We're going to talk about the threat from the sun, which is going into its solar maximum. We're going to talk about a high altitude electromagnetic pulse, the different uh, effects, waveforms from that. We'll talk uh, a little bit to some of the devices that might be used in some circumstances. We're going to talk about uh, various aspects of this situation. My friends, it's not straightforward as you think. This is a complex topic. I'm going to go all through it. We're going to talk, like I said, about some of the devices that claim to help. So let's just go straight into some of these articles so I can show you what I am talking about. And uh, here we go. This is from the sun. The main thing you're going to have to worry about an electromagnetic pulse, maybe your house catching on fire. Can you protect yourself from that? Well, maybe in some cases. Now, there's three waveforms of electromagnetic pulse. I'm going to show you those in a minute, E1, E2, and E3. I'll explain those in a moment. But from a solar event, a solar coronal mass ejection, you get the E3 longer wave waveform. And that has had a history of causing fires, most notably with the Carrington event in 1859, and also an event we call the railroad event, which occurred in 1921. In both cases, fires were started from these. Now, how did they start fires? It's because there was so much voltage on the lines that these long conductors, which pick up the long waveforms, that they surged enough current to start a fire. So these long lines are collectors. They are collectors that will pick up that charge. I was hunting a device. Anyway, so look at this. The Carrington event uh, was 2 September 1859 in solar storm cycle 10. And it was said that it caused sparking and even fires in multiple telegraph stations. Ah, uh, but that's not alone. See, and there was another solar storm, May 1921 that among the most extreme non geomagnetic storms, uh, which uh, this one also caused uh, uh, fires, get this, caused fires at a signal tower and telegraph station, caused total communication blackouts for several hours. So uh, we see already instances of fires caused by these. Now, bear in mind, back in the day, telegraph stations had wires that came in one port through the wall through a big glass uh, insulator and they, and the wires went straight to the desk. Back in the day, especially in 1859, houses weren't wired through and through like they are today. So Greg, how's this going to start a fire? Well, we're going to look at wires and other things here in just a moment. We'll look more into this. So to give you an idea, why do I say uh, you know, the answer lies between no to uh, maybe in some circumstances. Well, with a high altitude electro, uh, electromagnetic pulse, like from a nuke uh, set off, as this one shows, at something like four kilometers, 400 kilometers high or 250 miles, like where a satellite orbits or an ICBM might be coming in. If one were detonated there, say over North Dakota, for example, this shows relative uh, field intensities that would occur. Now, this is based on the idea of, of the, uh, not an EMP super weapon, but the, the just a regular nuke, a uh, uh, 50,000 uh, volts per meter uh, type event. The EMP super weapons are rated at 200 volts per meter. And most of the devices that you, I'll be showing you aren't tested to that level. So this, this is, lays the danger out, but you can see the fill intensity varies. It's actually greater south of the uh, detonation. This has a lot to do with the layout of the, and the use shape here, the layout and distribution of Earth's magnetic field. All this starts from, uh, this is the E1. Uh, now, this is not the E3. This is just the E1 part of the waveform. This starts from something called the Compton effect in which a gamma ray hits an atom in the upper atmosphere and strips the electrons off and it spirals down 
uh, as it's spiraling down the uh, uh, magnetic field lines, but then this electron is knocked off and it travels at relativistic speeds, 90% of the speed of light through the atmosphere. So this is what you get with the Compton effect. And these are the kind of fields that puts out. But you got to deal with E2 and E3 on top of that. E2 is a waveform that uh, is basically from the neutrons. And it looks a lot like lightning. It has many similarities to lightning. E3 is the long wave waveform that's picked up by any long conductors like power lines, rail lines, and also uh, pipelines. They can all pick up these long form radiation that you get with E3 because that's a, a lot lower frequency. And it, what happens is that it, these are high voltages. Now, sometimes high voltage, a high voltage doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a big current. But when you've got the wires and rail lines and uh, you've got the uh, various long conductors, pipes, pipelines, uh, they're a huge collector. They're like ginormous antennas. And when you're collecting that kind of voltage on every meter over kilometers or miles of the conductor, it's going to surge a big current. For those that understand electrical current, you know, there's this old equation, voltage equals current times resistance. If you don't know what the current can be, just divide by resistance and you got uh, current equals voltage divided by re resistance. So uh, that is can be a big number, especially if the voltage is number high. Now that also is related to uh, ampacity, how much current can the conductor actually carry. At some point the conductor will burn out, but a lot of damage can be done before that wire cable or pipeline or rail line actually burst into flames, especially wires, cables, high voltage transmission lines and such. But these things are capable of carrying a lot more current, even uh, the ones that come in your house are capable of carrying up to 200, over 200 amps. They're typically rated at 200 amps, but uh, that is within a lot of safety margin. They can probably carry double that or more. Uh, as you may remember, when we had a big brownout in the Northeast several years ago, from uh, overheated wire that draped down and hit a tree because it got too hot and was the metal was expanding and it sagged and uh, that took out uh, the whole Northeast in power. That was a lot more current going through that line than should have been. And so you can get a lot more than, because you, you derate your wires for safety factor. So what comes in the house can be considerably more than the 200 amp service that you may be signed up for. This is what you got, and, and especially in short-term surge, because uh, yeah, E3, let, let me show you something about it. E3 lasts for uh, you know tens to hundreds of seconds here. An E3 waveform can be a long waveform. So uh, it's the time and current that, that, that multiply together that can burn out your conductors. Although a high enough voltage can flash burn a uh, conductor right off the bat. Your uh, E1, takes place in, within the span of nanoseconds. I'm going to show you more on that here in a moment. All right, here are some of the potential exposure areas from various altitudes of uh, an electromagnetic pulse. As you see, uh, this is, now this is the range, not the altitude. The altitude is here at the color bars. 30 miles is this circle. This circle is 120 miles up and uh, from uh, 300 miles up, you cover all of this, all of Mexico, most of Canada, and the United States. So uh, a better, more concise picture of this is rendered here in a report called uh, Nuclear EMP Attack Scenarios and Combined Armed Cyber Warfare, written by the late, great Dr. Peter Vincent Fry, who I've had on this channel multiple times before he passed away. He was a real champion for trying to get the power grid hardened. Who am I to talk about this stuff? What are my credentials? Well, I've chaired two power grid defense conferences. I have over 40 decades of engineering experience under my belt, 20 of which, 20 years of which was in the area of uh, avionics system safety for rockets and spacecraft. So uh, I'll bring a lot to the table here. I'm a member of two uh, task force that are trying to prevent uh, this from occurring. Two national level uh, committees, task force. So guys, this is a, a map this inner circle here is at uh, the height of a balloon, 30 kilometers. This is what a balloon can do. And to show you 
where I went into great detail on this myself in a video, which I will share with you guys uh, a link later that I did uh, back, uh, oh, it says 10 months ago. I think it was longer than that. Showing uh, the effects. This is also showing the fill intensities as it reaches out. This is re uh, from a report done by Meditech, and it shows you the percent fill strength. And again, it shows you that U characteristic and the 100% fill strength would be right here in the red. Now, bear in mind, if you got a 200,000 volt per meter, that would be EMP super weapon, that would be extremely intense because most of the hardening specs and specs a lot of stuff is built to was built for 50 kilovolts per meter, 50 kilo, which is a 25%, 25% of the... Uh, <laughs> of the rated power of the EMP super weapon. And I'm gonna back that up in just a moment here too. So you can see these various circles. That is the point of detonation for this particular scenario, somewhere in the middle of Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska. You know, kind of a four state area. That's it. This one was shown to be detonated over there. And you can see that this 50, uh, 30 to 50 percent fill strength which exceeds for an EMP super weapon, the hardening spec covers more than all the United States. And if it's just a regular EMP weapon that's not an EMP super weapon, that's still very significant. You might possibly have a chance if it's not an EMP super weapon. Who has EMP super weapon technology? Well, China has claimed they've got it. They've admitted it. Russia has admitted it. And Russia also admits that they gave the technology to North Korea. Now, it may be that Iran has this, too. And as we are on the precipice of war with Iran, because Iran's getting technology from Russia, China, and North Korea, who's to say they don't have this technology? This could totally bring the United States to its knees. Now, just to show you, this is from that same video. I'll, show, I'll have a link to this in the show notes below. This is the uh, uh, altitude from a satellite, basically here in this red circle. Uh, this is... Uh, all the rest of these are balloons. The black ones is uh, at a balloon altitude. The blue circles are from a ro uh, balloon-assisted rocket launch, a, a, a rocket launch from a balloon, which is known as a raccoon, which I was launching these things. 20 this circle corresponds with the capability and altitude of a system I launched 24 years ago from the Gulf of Mexico. So this is also why I bring expertise to the table here that uh, few can bring to the table talk of it because I could have made these blue circles or the red, uh, these black circles easily with the altitudes I could have reached with the devices that I was building 24 years ago and earlier for the black circles. But guys, take this seriously. The project I was doing here was done out of a couple of garages with a handful of people on a shoestring budget. And if I could have done it 24 years ago, what can nations or uh, far better funded uh, T groups, as we might call them, accomplish today with the technology and the systems they have really available to them? The first space war, you might remember, just got fought between the Houthi rebels and Israel because Israel intercepted missiles from Houthi rebels over the von Karman line, which was 100 kilometers high. So we're talking blue circle, guys, for that stuff. So take this seriously. Also, these uh, weapons can be launched from container ships, from ISO shipping containers offshore. I, in this video, go over how you could place every one of those black circles from balloons or other devices. I cover that in great depth in that video. So look out, guys. And that's the name of that video if you want to search for it on my channel. All right, guys. So let's go on. You got to bear in mind, the, the, uh, we got to worry a lot we got to worry about a lot more than just our home burning down. And by the way, uh, what good are the, is these devices going to be after the fact when there's not going to be a power grid anyway? It's like, you know, okay, I saved all my devices. Giddy, giddy, giddy. Well, you're probably not going to get to use them unless you got a, your own power generation. But when that equipment burns out, wears out, as it will, if you've had this kind of attack with thousands of uh, high-powered transformers uh, fried, the grid's not coming back. It's not going to be turned back on in a year two years, three years. No, it's not happening. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end of this video. I've discussed it before. All right. This is, oh shoot, it skipped back up to the top. This is a congressional testimony by uh, 
Dr. William Graham. And this testimony, I had it scrolled down to me, it popped back up the top. He talked about the EMP super weapons and the fact that the Russians had, had told him that they had developed these 200,000 volt per meter EMP super weapons. And this is something that they knew could be developed. So there wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like they didn't know this could be done. In fact, we know how it can be done. And they said they've done it. Now, consider Russia's got more nuclear weapons than anybody. This is totally within the realm of what they, the Chinese, and North Korea could do. I uh, see. I had it pulled up. I hate it that it scrolled down. Uh, here we go. Right there it is. Uh, weapon that could generate fills in the range of 200,000 volts per meter. Here it is. In the congressional record, from 2008. So this is not classified. It has been publicly published. Again, this is from Dr. William Graham. And you go, well, who is Dr. William Graham? Well, he was the head of the Congressional EMP Task Force. He is considered the world's foremost expert on EMPs and also on Soviet weapons. And he was a weapons system, he was a weapons negotiator with Russia. And he also served as the NASA administrator for some time. This is him, Dr. William Robert Graham. And you can look him up here on Wikipedia. And his EMP warnings are also mentioned on here because he made a big case out of this. And he's written papers on that as late as 2017, talking about the significance of North Korean satellites. Why well, we need to worry about those satellites in orbit from North Korea. It's not, it's, we may already have EMP super weapons in orbit that could deliver that long range. And you can also see here he is as a administrator of NASA. I kid you not. I don't make this stuff up, my friends. Guys, if the grid goes down, you better be able to come up with your own food. I consider highly, or I urge you highly to go to sources like True Leaf Springtime. Go to my links below on True Leaf Market and Eden Brothers and order you some seeds so you can grow your own food. This is one thing you can do uh, because you ain't going to grocery stores, guys. When that happens, there's going to be no grocery stores. There'll be no cash registers, no internet. Yeah, get this stuff while the getting's good because this stuff can go down any day, either in uh, perspective war or E3 wave four from the sun. Now, let me ask you this. This is mill standard uh, 188-125-1. This is the standard for hardening your facilities for electromagnetic pulse. And what they show here is a facility that's got a, a facility EMP shield around it. And it's got uh, inside of that, it's got a waveguide, a conductive waveguide shield inside of this. And then they got these points of entry, POEs, where your wires come through. And everything is how you show these. And look. They've even got a foyer. You see this here? They got a foyer here, weather door. You got a foyer, you go through one door to close before you can go into another. Now, this is how you harden a facility from an EMP. Is your house hardened like this? Do you have all of this for your house? No. It also, it's come out that the federal government is doing a rush to get their facilities hardened by the 31st of October. All these different federal facilities. Are they going to have all this? No. Can they be really and truly hardened from an EMP? No, not entirely. So, and also I've mentioned in one of the other videos how uh, an individual took his uh, homemade test set that would generate, well, it's kind of like a CHIMP device, which they can do an EMP from non-nuclear EMP from a missile. Yeah, there's a device called the CHIMP. Well, you can make these suitcase EMP devices too. And one guy was testing one of his facilities with one of those, and it was only putting out 37,000 volts per meter, and he defeated one of these so-called hardened facilities with it. Yeah, they got it. They got the pulse inside. So even with all this, you may not be safe. Your Faraday cage may not be safe either, because most Faraday cages aren't built to these standards. The facility standards are very high. Now, this mill standard is cited by certain other uh sources say, oh yeah, we comply with this mill standard. We got a little chintzy device that's going to protect your home and all of its electronics. Really? You cite this and you don't show that? Let me just scroll up here at the top. 
Department of Defense Interface Standard for High Altitude Electromagnetic Pulse. Hemp protection for ground-based facility performing critical time urgent missions. This is from our most critical Department of Defense missions. This is how they want you to hard your facilities. And this goes into a lot of other stuff, a lot of other testing. It talks about these uh, points of entry, what's got to be done for them. Uh, and the standards here are high. And even then, it's not 100%. <laughs> like I mentioned, these other things failed in some cases. These facilities have failed. Now, look at this uh, inner facility. It's called a conductive wave guide facility. Basically, these are like pipe, conductive pipes that would conduct. See this? This is your metallic uh, pipe and wave guide. So you would put these around the facility. Typical wave guide below cutoff piping, and especially for your points of entry. So you don't just have a wire running into your house, especially a wire with a some little device attached to it, and expect that it's really going to protect your home. So my this is the first answer to why these uh, most of these things you're getting and trying to protect your home with probably are going to have a problem. And here's something else you need to see. I think I've dialed this up somewhere else in this presentation. The testing that they uh, uh, mandate here in this spec for the electrical points of entry, except for RF antenna lines, the testing level, injected pulse characteristics and residual internal stress limits for classes of electrical points of entry. Now, you got to remember, these points of entry are the, the uh, holes in that big double Faraday cage, which includes waveguide inside, which is way more than you're going to get out of your garbage can. <laughs> it's, it's very high standards, guys. Uh, they require a test that's 5,000 ounce short pulse. And here we're talking two, the, the, two times 10 to the minus eight for the rise time. So that's in the nanosecond range. And then they, they got a 2,500 amp short test. Then they got a couple of intermediary pulse test of 250 amps, but long pulse test of 100 amps. This must be for your E3 waveforms. I would imagine that's why they got this because this is long pulse. And here they've got a rise time of uh, you know, two tenths of a second, basically. See, this is in seconds. And 20 to 25 uh, seconds on uh, this uh, that full wave, uh, you know, that, that stuff there. So guys, and this is the residuals uh, here. This is what this chart's for. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this in a little bit. So let's go on through here. Let's rock on through here. Now guys, I did do a video about how to survive an EMP, survive an EMP grid down. This is an hour long video. I will put it in the link above at the end of this video. So you'll be able to click on the tab to watch this video because this is more pertinent to what you need to do to actually survive in the EMP. It also tells you how to do the Faraday cages. It also goes into such things as tactics, how to tactically maneuver uh, food. Yeah, I cover a large range of topics in this video. It's a must watch if you really want to be able to survive this stuff. I've also got some videos on how to survive nuclear war. But we got to start with the basics. Let's go to the wire. A lot of your devices in your home are protected by a ground wire. This ground wire typically is six AWG or a six gauge wire. For a 200 amp service and above, you know, it may be like a four gauge wire, as it's showing you here. So Greg, what does that mean? What can these wires handle? Well, let's look at this. Let's go down here, a six gauge wire. This talks about, you know, it's gonna be a diameter of 4.1 millimeters. That's a fair size wire. Four gauge wire would be 5.2. Your house is probably normally got, you know, uh, AWG 14, maybe AWG 12. That shows those by comparison. So what can a six uh, gauge wire carry? A uh, single cord, 95 amps. If it's less than a single cord, like a single wire, like I showed you, 95 amps is all you can really expect it to carry. Not 250 amps. Hmm. Four gauge wire, though, will go about a, oh, 120 amps. I missed it. Six gauge is not, it. let's see, six gauge is 95 amps. Yeah, okay, they didn't skip here. Four gauge is 120 amps. Not a very large current. 
So if your device is shunting all that to ground, uh, the the cap the capacity of that wire is limited. Now it will take more for a very short pulse, yes, but only to a point, only to a point. But see, here's another thing that you're not told about by a lot of these devices. They don't tell you this. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm going to tell you this. Any electrical engineer ought to know this. And the electronics tech ought to know this. You have something called current division. And current, and this happens with all your devices that have shunts on them, by the way. You can't entirely keep the current out of your house because you have the current will come down and it's going to divide it between the various resistances. Now, a path to ground should be a low resistance. I think the spec on that is 25 amps, actually. No, 25 ohms. The spec for your ground path in your home is 25 ohms. So if this were your ground path, if R2 is that what you're shutting to, it does have a resistance. But so most of the current will tend to go through the lower resistance, but it's not all going to go there. If you got extreme high current, you still got some going through R1. This may be your house. So even if you shunt it, you're probably not switching the entire current. This is what you need to know. So it's got one voltage from top to bottom. Hopefully the bottom is zero. It's typically what you got if you got ground. So just check that out. Voltage, excuse me, current division. Voltage division is when you got resistors in series. Current division is in parallel. Well, when you got a shunt that's trying to protect you from your home, you've got current division. They don't tell you this with a lot of these devices. So they can't entirely protect you, but they can help. So what you got to also know about there's something else. You might get current up through the ground <laughs> because uh, geomagnetically induced currents are currents that flow within the ground primarily due to interaction between solar wind and the magnetosphere. This happens naturally. During geomagnetic storms, when the solar wind is particularly strong, these currents can be much stronger, potentially impacting power grids and causing infrastructure damage. This is from the ground, from the ground. They didn't tell you that one, did they? So it might come back up through the ground line. Now, you guys ask me about burying stuff. Oh, you know, we can bury it. That'll do us some good. We'll just bury our stuff. No, it won't help you at all because these effects have burned out underground cables. Also, the uh, the 19, uh, 1859 and 1921 events burned out underground, underwater sea cables. Look it up, guys. Look it up. The, the, so this talks about the Soviet test, which was... Now, we know about the Starfish Prime device, which is, uh, and, and also the uh, Russians did a Soviet Test 184. Their device was a lot smaller than our Starfish Prime in, uh, device. And so they didn't expect the kind of effects from it that they got. But it was at a higher altitude, higher latitude, more north. The more north you go, the larger your effect. The Starfish Prime effect, uh, they burned out 300 street lights and uh, did other damage in Hawaii. Now, the closer you get to the equator, the less uh, field intensity you're going to have from an E1 or an E3, probably. So this was an E3 effect that hit the power lines and burned them out in uh, Kazakhstan. So let's see, where is it in here? Uh, yeah, induced a current surge in a long underground power cable that caused fires at the power plant in the city of, uh, how do you pronounce that? Karaganda. This is in, this is in Kazakhstan. So uh, this was very significant, my friend. So if you think being underground is going to protect you, no. If you think that you can't get something coming up from the ground, wrong answer. If you think a, a large scale uh, solar uh, E3 event will only occur on the sunlit side of the uh, uh, sun. Wrong answer. The 18 feet, excuse me, the 1989 Quebec event occurred at night and caused the power grid in Quebec to fail. 
So wrong answer. I hear these wrong answers put out all the time. So I am trying to correct the record here. Now this is showing you uh, the general connections for uh, how to connect a surge protector to your house. This is the general wiring diagram for one here. And they do show it at the surge arrestor on the side. They show you connecting it up to the black wires, uh, this device to the, where the uh, current is on the high voltage side of these lugs here of your first, uh, your first uh, relays, what do you call them? Uh, <laughs> the circuit breakers, excuse me, in your house because they're closer to the source. So you want to shunt that to the ground. So this device will shunt some of that to the ground but it can only carry as much current as these little wires can carry. These have less ampacity than that big copper ground uh, line. They're not anywhere near a uh, six gauge or four gauge, they're much smaller. So how much can they really carry? That is a question I've got. Now this talks about, here's one of your uh, surge protectors from Eaton. Uh, these are you know, typically uh, bought to protect your house from lightning. The problem with these devices for protecting from an EMP is they're not fast enough to really do the job for an EMP because the EMP E1 waveform uh, peaks at 4.8 nanoseconds. So you have to have a very fast switching device. Now it might help. These are typically built, Siemens probably builds the best with the highest rated components of these things. Um, this is water, water heater timer, <laughs> dot org. Anyway, here they're talking about their surge protectors, and they give you some uh, some uh, what it will protect. This is your typical surge protector. It protects most, but not nearly all, lightning strikes beyond 100 feet. Surge protectors will not protect lightning strikes within 100 feet. So it's just going to talk about what you know. You got inverse square law. The further you are away from uh, a strike. And in this case, it might be just inverse R because of the, the, if the strike is coming down the line. But if it's from the point of entry, it's probably inverse square. <clears throat> so, guys, the fill strength falls off rapidly with distance of, 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 of the fill. That's another thing for a lightning strike, that is. And same way with a nuclear weapon, but, uh, and as I showed you what the fill intensities were for that a few moments ago. So what you really need to do to protect, the best thing, now, you're not going to get 100% protection for your home. You just can't get 100%, but you might be able to up it. One of the best things you can do is put ferret beads on the power input lines where it first comes in. These ferret beads are inductors or chokes. What it shows here is signal. A steady state signal will get through, but noise or some deviation won't get through with a uh, ferret bead. Now, where you'd put the ferret beads is right where the uh, your power lines come into the house, one on uh, each leg. So ferret beads are coils. They're inductors. They tend to put a back current. And when you put a surge in here, it's something that's different. When you change the current in it, they, because they, uh, they will actually put an inverse uh, force going back the other way that will dampen that out. That is another device that could help. But some of these devices are sold uh, without telling you you need stuff like this. That gives you a little more protection. But how wet, and you can also put surge protectors through your house and everything else, but they're not going to help you from a uh, fast acting E1. Again, it peaks at 4.8 nanoseconds. It's really quick. Now, you might have seen these on some of your devices, these kind of things like this. So what is that? That's a surge protector. That's a ferrite type bead, what they call it, a ferret block, block, ferret choke. The coils are typically chokes. Let's see what this shows us here. Yeah, see, that's a coil there. And what it's trying is coils are your typical chokes. So here you see it's got a coil in here. This provides a back, a back force. So, but, you know, anyway. Now there's devices you can get off Amazon like these beads, ferret beads. And they're gonna depend on what kind of current you wanna protect them against. You gotta find something that's rated for the size of the power lines in your house. RFI, EMI, noise suppression. That's what they're using. So you gotta have the really big ones for your house, power. 
this is all different sizes here, lots of them. You would have to go in and, and really search some like 200 amps <laughs> or above to protect your house. Um, and I just look at some of the other things. Low voltage surge protecting devices for residents. Low voltage. This means the kind of voltage you'd see in your house. Now, these are large surge protectors made by Siemens. I mean, large relative speaking compared to some of the others. These wires aren't really too tiny there. They don't look like in this system here. Not as tiny as some I've seen in other stuff. Now, these guys give you a 10-year, $50,000 warranty or 10 thousand after that i guess so they got a pretty good warranty here for that but then again what's it for it is for lightning protection basically or other surges you might see the higher voltage devices look like these <laughs> inside a lot of your uh, equipment like your electronics equipment you might put stuff like you're in your plants your industrial boxes you might have stuff like this that would be inside a neiman uh NEMA rated box, which is gives you some EMP shield on top of it. But they still have these devices inside to protect against current. Now you can come here on Amazon and uh, look for like a Siemens whole house surge protector. And this is rated, it says for 140,000 ounces. You can get it for $218. Siemens will have top, uh, top rated components in their system there. These wires, yeah, they're still not that great. So I don't know. That would have to be a, for a very short pulse. Oh, right, also, by the way, guys, that if you go back to that water heater timer chart I showed you about from that organization, they'll tell you that these things don't last forever. You have to replace them because they are always seeing surges and it wears them out. There's always some surges in your system. And yeah, they do wear out. Now, this is disasterprepare.com. They have a lot of EMP products here to include uh, these various uh, ferrite beads. And these would be sized for what you need for your home, by the way, if you were to come in here to uh, Disaster Preparer, this website. We've got a lot of different things in here. And this is a pretty good source for stuff. But again, you know, is your home in a Faraday cage? With a wave guide facility built inside of it, that's what's going to you're going to have to have to have a reasonable chance of protecting yourself from EMP. A Faraday cage with a wave guide facility inside of it, and specific points of entry that are highly protected, like no windows and all that stuff. Now, admittedly, you can help. It would help if uh, your house was painted in a conductive paint, and you had uh, conductive screens covering all your windows. I know Curtis Stone did that. When, with his house in uh, Kiwana, British Columbia. This is something you can do. I had a friend who did that here in Huntsville. And if your house is properly protected like that, you won't be able to use this. If it's proper and tight, you will not be able to use your cell phone inside of it. So if your cell phone works inside your house, your house is not protected from N1. I don't care what devices you attach to it. I do not care what devices from who makes them, none of them, are 100%. That's my whole point. Nothing is 100%. Now, some people and some companies out here are telling you that you got all this great protection. Do you really? Do you really have such great protection on this? These guys. Now, I have a one of my uh, subs gave me a comment and said he had one of these attached and he had a lightning strike nearby and it fried most everything in his house with one of these devices attached. So if, if, if this happens to you, I would say call them up and get you $25,000, see if, how that works. I don't know. If you've been hit by lightning and, and had it fail with one of these, I'd like to know. And did you avail yourself of their guarantee and did they honor it? I don't know. These are some mighty small wires, guys. If this thing is meant to shunt power that could exceed 250 volts to your ground wire. Now, for a sh very short period of time, it might handle it. I mean, nanoseconds. But for the E3 waveform, which could last for several seconds, maybe 100 seconds, would it work? Would it work? And when I look at the size of these wires, 
they're telling you this is all phases, E1, E2, and E3, lightning and solar flare protection. How do they know this? Well, they got test reports. But in the test report that they got on their own site, I don't see 228,000 ounce in the test report they put in here. I don't see it, my friends. How do they make this claim? And they say it will protect all the electronics and equipment connected to your electrical system. All electronics and equipment. Really? Really? How does it do that? What I just show you that this spec I just showed you here showed that big facility. And we're going to, I'm going to go over this spec here too. This tells you how to test stuff. Yikes, guys. I, how do they make these claims? If I could believe in this, I'd be selling them on here. I could have made a killing selling this device on my website. I don't do that because I have no faith in it. Why do I have no faith in it? Well, just for starters, look at those wires. And for two, I know their claims are high. They had a video out once saying, this will protect, your, protect I haven't seen this video, though. apparently they took it off. They used to say that we'll protect your home from 42 EMPs. Really? Oh, my gosh. You tell me how, because each time you get hit, it's going to fry things even further. Okay, now this is the test report right here. They claim they got compliance. Verify to comply that it's been laboratory tested to verify compliance with the fallen mill standards. They list all these. Well, I'm going to show you what's tested in there. I will show you. What's interesting is when you come in here, where they actually show the uh, actual specs, if you click on them, it does not take you to that spec. Instead, it, takes, take, it does not take you to the spec. Maybe they don't want you to really read it and figure it out. It takes you instead to the test report, not to the spec. Hmm, interesting. Why is that? Why don't they take you to the spec there and have a different link for that? Now, once again, the E1 waveform is a wide frequency. It goes up through 300 kilohertz. It's got wide frequency of altitude from zero to over 300 kilohertz. And it starts to drop off after 10 megahertz somewhat, but at the type of volts per meter we're talking about, that's still very substantial power way out there. This is their test report now. This is the actual test report that you will get if you click on that. Yeah, they did do tests. There were tests, and the test tested. It passed. But were these tests wide enough and adequate enough to really match what the spec calls out? These tests were done in March or completed and signed off actually and the tests were done in March. It was all this was signed off the second day of April 2019. Five years ago. You see here all the acronyms. So this report really ought to provide more text explaining what they actually did. Instead it just shows the test setup, what they tested. The test run on it. There's not a lot of narrative in here. So you got this pulse current injection, and you got this radiated susceptibility 105 test. This comes from your mill standard uh, 461G. Uh, we cared a lot about mill standard 41, uh, uh, 461, ELF particularly, and a lot of the rocket systems that I was working on because you worry about these. Uh, radars and other uh, potential RF attacks that might occur on your rocket in flight, particularly just the big radars that are used on out the ranges, I'll show you know along the shoreline. But they say, see here, five thousand amps. Remember I showed you the five thousand amps, the two thousand five hundred amps. Here it says complied. But if you actually read the test data itself. It does not in here anywhere tell you they tested the 5,000 amps or 2,500 amps. 
there should be some explanation of that. I don't see it. I don't see that anywhere in this report. Oops, it tells you what these are, uh, mill standards cover. Tells you the equipment they used. Intermediate pulse. See, they did the intermediate pulse test. Rise time calibration. These charts are hard to read. It's too bad you can't see it better. What you look at here, this is amps up here. This is the 200 amp level here. And this would be time. This is very, very hard to read. It, I believe it's in, uh, it looks like a US, it would, looks like microseconds, not nanoseconds. I don't know. Hard to read that. Very hard to read that. It looks like a, I don't know, it looks like a mu. I can't tell this level. I don't know. Maybe I can blow it up. Let's blow it up and see if we can read that a little better. Oh, maybe worse than milliseconds? Milliseconds ain't nothing. What's this one? Yeah, that one is microseconds. You need to be testing in nanosecond range. Yes, yeah, microseconds. Microseconds is nothing. You got to test in milliseconds to make this stuff work, guys. So, again, you see this is, uh, that's about your 250 volts, which is what the intermediate test calls for. Again, here it tells you what the test level is at in amps, up to 250. Uh, the test level is up to 250. This was the actual current. So sometimes it exceeded it a little bit, 264 amps. And that's milliseconds. 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 Where's the nanoseconds at? Milliseconds. I don't know, guys. Yeah, that's a that's a whole millisecond. That's a zero millisecond. Uh, you need to be one thousand times smaller than that to get a good readout. Again, coax two uh, test two hundred fifty amps. One cent plot milliseconds. Milliseconds. You can see this one was just over hundred amps. Milliseconds. You can pull us a report up this on their website. You can pull it up and look at it yourself. Don't take my word. I'll probably take it down now that I'm doing this report. <laughs> I'll probably take this off. Hmm. And these are fast rise times, but it's again milliseconds. What? Here again, test levels up to 250 amps. Uh, the actual test current looks like 200. 38, uh, they had voltages though, you know, that were, you know, the 345 range, 362 volts, I guess, VDC. You might see a lot more than that. This is, uh, what, 25 amps? Oh, that's a very small amperage. What's the rise time? Milliseconds. Oh, come on. Milliseconds on all these? Milliseconds, less than 100 amps. They did do a lot of tests, and the test they performed, it passed. My question is, are these tests adequate? And even if they did do the full range of tests without the Faraday cage, can you really expect it to protect all your devices? Hey, I'm just showing you what they got on their website. Again, less than there's nothing much over 250 volts in any of these, and some of them are less than 100. All these charts are, we had one chart in microseconds. I haven't seen anything in nanoseconds. What I tell you the rise time was for the E1, 9 point, oh, excuse me, 4.8 nanoseconds. Test, 250 amps. And it's all again, 262.7. 
Here are the voltages were like 57, 39, 41, 250 amps. These are all the intermediate test. Where's the 5,000 amp test? Where is the 1,000 amp long duration test? I'd want to see that to know I could survive a E3 event. All milliseconds, all low voltages. See, there's this goes on and on, and you're you're going to see the same kind of stuff throughout this entire report. This is a report, their test report, tested to a portion of 461G. Now this one got a little higher. This one is probably maybe up to, now look at this. This might be up to 275, or I'm just looking at the chart here. Um, amps. I would submit you can get a lot more amperage than that on your 200 amp service coming to your house, especially for very short pulse time, or even maybe in a few seconds where everything would burn out. <clears throat> Again, milliseconds, you know, maybe 275, two, there's talking 267, that's what they're showing us on these charts. Milliseconds, milliseconds. Yeah, just over 200 amps on this one. L200% plot. So this is, you know, this device would be switching in, probably where that little diamond's at. Again? This is the test table. You can see 250 amps tested. That was the test level. The current, I guess, is what they were actually carrying, 222.2. The highest voltage was 315 volts. Now, that's a very low voltage test there. Was that about 20 volts? They did a lot of tests. They were doing mill standard type test, but did the switching time really bear out here? They claim their device is fast switching. They claim that's the value of their devices. It switches in nanoseconds, just a few nanoseconds. I don't know, where's the proof? Milliseconds test. There's a long distance between millisecond and a and a nanosecond. Hmm. Short pulse. Now this is more interesting. Rise time on the short pulse. Here they're using 500, 500 millivolts. Okay, we're cooking now, right? 500 millivolts. What's 500 millivolts? Half a volt. Millis is 1,000. So 500 one thousandths is a half of a volt. A lot of people, oh, look here, 500 millivolts. Woo-hoo. Well, we're cooking now. Really? Hmm. Here we got, now we got some nanosecond data, 18.9 nanoseconds. Now, this one might be, for this pulse, a good switching time. But then again, this chart, you know, if you go into it, you might get to study it better. They don't really show the gradation very well on here. It's kind of hard to interpret their plot. 1.82 volts at the delta. Where's the delta at point at? I don't see their delta point. At 18.9 nanoseconds. Well, that, is that the total chart? Or is that where it switched at? What do these deltas mean, actually? I don't know, guys. If the whole thing is five nanoseconds, it might have switched fast enough. Five hundred ninety millivolts. How do you get five hundred ninety millivolts down here? Five hundred millivolts over here, and you're talking about one point two volts. I, how do you how do you reconcile the data here when it tells you 2.5 volts and you got 500 millivolts here? Is that the starting point? 
590 millivolts over here. So you go from 500 to 590, 200 nanoseconds. That's a long time for switching. This shows trigger with a question mark. What do I mean by that? Did it trigger here? Is this where the pulse started? Channel two. Maybe this is what they measured. That might have been the injected current here. So why don't they have the different colors on these other different charts? I can't say that it won't switch fast. Some of these tests, uh, they should write, there should have been a lot more narrative in this test report. That is my statement there. Should have been a lot more narrative. But uh, they're lacking a series of tests in this. Let's see. Why are they lacking the higher amperage test? Maybe they got an answer for this, but why is it not explained? Immediate test again. Now they're going back to the same kind of stuff here, and it's, these are the same kind of tests we saw earlier, coming up about 250 uh, volts here, fall time calibration pot. That's where things are falling off. Again, 250 amps, 250 amps, 250 amps. This is what we're seeing in the plots. It's on and on, just like this. this they got a lot of tests. They did do a lot of tests. I'll give them that credit. Now, maybe they will come back to me and, and answer my questions since I've been in this video. I'd like to hear the answers. If they can convince me this thing works, I, you know, shoot, man, I can make a fortune selling this stuff. As much as I cover EMP. <laughs> this is their test setup for that uh, intermediate pulse. They got their unit here on some styrofoam on a wooden table. Yeah, it should be on wood because it's non-conducting. Now they got a room here with the RF uh, uh, and audio shield stuff there. Looks like a coil here of some type. They did list all the devices. It's like in a junction box here, but these are very small conductors and leads. None of this stuff's going to conduct a lot of current. These are very small wires. Good, they show the test set up. That's good. And this is everyone on the test they showed before. Now they did do the radiated susceptibility test, which is per uh, no standard 40. 461G, RS-105. Why don't they do RS-101, 103? Maybe because they're not transit pulses, maybe? This is their uh, 105 test, radiated susceptibility is what that stands for. I'm familiar with that kind of stuff. Now, 50 millivolts. Not a lot of voltage there, up to 53 millivolts. And where's the delta point at? Again, 2.7 nanoseconds. If it switches at 2.7 nanoseconds, that's fast enough. If. But that's hard to interpret from these charts. But even if it switches, you still got current division, guys. And this is a measurement at the breaker box. This is what the breaker box is seeing, which should be protected from these events. So you shouldn't be seeing anything at the, well, you're still going to get current division. You're going to see something at the breaker box. 112 volts is the delta, wherever delta is. Maybe that's your green line here. Maybe that green line is 112 volts. Or is this 112? What is that one? What's green? Channel 2, 200 volts. That's something you'd expect at a breaker box. Because you could have 220. 
580 millivolts. And this is a Romex plot. There's a test set up for the radiated susceptibility test, which is a lot more stringent. Again, they do have a breaker box here, a small breaker box, a very small one. This is like maybe, what, a 50 amp breaker box maybe with their shield device there. And they say everything complied. Well, for that test and for what they tested, it may have done that. See, my problem lies in the actual test itself. We'll come back to uh, MEL standard uh, 188-125-1. What we see is the intermediate pulse test here at 250 amps. This is the test they did. Where's the long pulse at 1,000 amps? Where's the 5,000 amps? Where's the 25,000 amps? Where are these tests at? Where's the 1,000 amps at? Where's the 5,000? Where's the 2,500? That's what I'm having some issue with that test report. And this is your one eighty eight one twenty five one. As I mentioned, it covers. See what you, what you still don't get with that device is your facility level protection. That's like point of entry protection, and it doesn't give you the kind of point of entry standards that the spec calls out. Does their shield, now maybe if you use it in a facility like this, that might be good. This is what most standard 18125-1 calls for. <laughs> so how is it you claim? Now maybe they got an answer to this. I love to hear it. How is it you claim that you can protect your device when uh, and you're compliant with the spec when to be EMP protective, the spec calls out a facility that's covered in a facility hemp shield with a conductive waveguide shield inside of it with an enclosure that you go through before you go through the door and all your devices go through what they call a point of entry. Now, I'll just give you further clarification. We'll go back and maybe a point of entry is defined up here in their definitions. Let's see. POE, point of entry, uh, they spell it out here. Conductive POE, all an electrical wire or cable or other conductive objects such as a metal rod, it passes through an electromagnetic barrier. Conductive POEs are also called penetrating conductors. So the basis for this is your entire facility is shielded. And then you do all these other things, all these other tests to cover what goes through the point of entry, point of entry, a location on the electromagnetic barrier where the shield, which is electromagnetic barrier, not the device uh, that, that's protecting the circuits itself, is penetrated by hemp and energy may be, uh, may be protected uh, volume. Let's see, let me read this again. A location on the electromagnetic barrier where the shield is penetrated and hemp energy may enter the protected volume unless adequate uh, POE protective shield is provided. Again, the shield isn't some device in this case, like the certain things promoted. It is what's around the facility. POEs are classified as, a, as aperture POEs or penetrating conductors according to the type of penetration. It also classifies architectural, mechanical, structural, or electrical POE POEs, points of entries, according to the architectural engineering discipline in which they are usually encountered. Whew. This is why I say that it's not very likely that you're going to protect your home and all the devices in it with anything. Because this standard is very high. 
And yet this standard and all those tests, if you read it, are for a 50,000 volt per meter MP, not the 200,000 volt per meter MP super weapon. Does that device you can buy from that company I just showed provide all this stuff? No. Now this shows how everything's connected, how it comes through your facility. Uh, this would be in, probably inside your facility. <coughs> facility hemp shield. See, that's part of it. This is part of your test. Then we can again, we come down to here. And you go down here and they go into great detail about these tests. If you scroll on down to the, uh, it goes the radius susceptibility test. And oh yeah, I think I got scrolled off. That's what I wanted to do was show you the, uh, why not, we already went through that. Now, there's an applicability. Yeah, there's an applicability chart here. I want to show you guys. It shows what tests are applicable for what facility from the RS, from the, uh, now that's in the other spec. Pardon me. As you can see, the test requirements are very high. So, where is it? You know, we need to find most standard 461G again. And I think I got it back. Uh, I'll go. It's back over here somewhere. Let me scroll this now. I'm going to see it. Mm. Well, I had it dialed up earlier. I may have wiped it out a minute ago. Okay. I don't have it pulled up right now. I thought I had it up. Anyway, um, there is also an RS-101 uh, and an RS-103. I don't know why they didn't test those. Those are listed as being more applicable to military facilities. Maybe it's because they're not uh, a... Um, a, well, nothing you might consider, guys, because it's, there aren't transit waveforms, and most of your MP is transit waveforms. That might explain that. Another thing you might want to consider is having alternate power sources. There's, there are diagrams out there to show you how to connect your generators into your grid. This would be like your junction box, and you have another little device that can pick and choose between either your solar panel, your generator, and your grid power. You can find online a lot of devices showing you how to connect all that kind of stuff up. So easy generator hookup. You know, there's a lot of instructions on the internet telling you what to do, what not to do. But you really sure you should hire an, ele uh, an, uh, an electrician to do these things. Never do this. Don't just plug your device straight into your grid. Because among other things, you could uh, if you have power lines down and you're running a generator, in your house, and you should have a power line failure, you could be putting, like, like a tornado comes in, knocks the power lines down, your power goes out, and you put a generator straight into your wiring, it could actually put that current back out on the power lines. And a technician goes out there to pick up the power lines, thinking, well, they got it killed back here. They don't know that you put a hot source on it, and they pick that up, and they're electrocuted. So there's a lot of things to consider, like there's a lot of things you have to do to save your system. Now, the biggest reason I say that uh, this is difficult, but I said you might be able to protect your home somewhat in some cases. If you're in a place where it's a lower fill strength, and if you use ferret beads in addition to some other surge protector, you might buy yourself some protection. But don't bank on it. Don't bank on it. I personally feel like these things are way over promoted. All of them for this kind of application. And the simple reason is you go to the specs, which even they cite. The specs tell you that you got to have uh, an EMP shield 
an internal enclosure that's got waveguide in the walls. Whoa, who's got that? That's in a very special facility. Who? Who's got that? That's difficult. And it you got devices in your house. You got a laptop, say, plugged in. That's a long conductor. It could pick up an E1, uh, an E3, E1, either one. It could come in and fire your device. Now, it could be that it picks it up from the wire inside your house because that device is at your circuit breaker box your wiring in your house may be long enough to pick up maybe it won't pick up e3 but that could pick up e1 your device itself might possibly although it's not as likely pick up the e1 internally chances are that the leads on your personal devices inside the wiring may not pick up anyone a good chance that this stuff that'll survive if it's not plugged in <laughs> but see the other thing they don't tell you about current division even with a system like that you're going to get some stuff inside the box now they did show a box level test but i didn't see where they were injecting the uh, 5,000 amps i didn't see where they were injecting 1,000 amps now they can come back and show me that How, though, is little wire about the size of that going to conduct so much current? It might conduct 250 amps for a second, nanosecond. <laughs> but for 20 seconds, let me tell you something. I built hybrid rockets and launched some high-altitude balloons. When we were first, our, our later balloons, we launched from the deck of a ship so we could go with the wind, so we could inflate that balloon straight up. Before that, when we were inflating balloons to launch from the ground, we had to hold them down. I said the entire balloon was up. Any little breeze would have knocked it over. And the balloon is very fragile. You can just touch it with your finger and just about make a hole in it. Those polyethylene, large polyethylene balloons like we used so we used a device called it a Chomi launcher, which is a ginormous piece of styrofoam uh, that uh, was locked in by two padded rollers. And the balloon itself was held between the styrofoam peanut, if it were, and these two felt-covered rollers. So everything was soft and wouldn't make a hole in it. And when you want to launch the balloon, you pop this device open, the styrofoam would pop out, and the balloon would go up. Well, to make that peanut shape, we use wire cutters. We glued a bunch of styrofoam sheets together, and we use wire cutters to make the shape we wanted. And the wire cutter was a thin medium uh, wire, uh, and we had a real step where we'd crank the voltage up to get that thing red hot so it would cut through the styrofoam. But we didn't run it full range. I ac accidentally hit the uh, real step when I was moving around on one occasion. It knocked it over, and I watched that wire go poof. It didn't melt. It, va it vaporized in a flash of light. Poof. It was nothing. Just a little smoke. <laughs> that wire, that metal, turned to vapor in a split second. Probably milliseconds. It was totally vaporized. Maybe nanoseconds. It, was, it just went poof. That's what happens when you put too much, conduct, too much current in a wire. It will burn. Or maybe even vaporize. You want that to happen to wires in your house? How well is your house really protected? Can you protect all the devices in your house? Really? That's what some of the claims are. Well, do you have a Faraday cage around your house? Do you have waveguide in your house? That's what the standard calls for. Now, outside of the, somewhere outside of the 50,000 uh, 50, volt per meter range, you might be okay. Maybe. But for an MP super weapon, I showed you from uh, that photograph from a, where a satellite altitude, where even if uh, for an MP super weapon, if you're out to the 30% level, you're still over 500,000 volts per meter, 50,000 volts per meter, which is the standard for which mill standard uh, 188 is written.
all those mo all those standards I showed you were written for the 50,000 volt per meter level. So considering they tested the standards that was not developed for the EMP super weapon, can it protect you? Considering it doesn't appear they tested the full range of injected currents from what I can read, does it protect you? And if they did, even if they tested everything in there for that device, since you're not in a Faraday cage with a, a waveguide facility inside, how well are you really protected? I'll let you make that decision. Now, I used to say on some of their claims that all the people and all these EMP groups were using their devices. Far from it. <laughs> Very far from the case. So I don't have any. I don't buy them. I'm not putting them in. And I don't promote them. Because I just don't have faith and confidence in that. Um, now, maybe if they can show me otherwise, if they convince me otherwise, like uh, like H. Ross Burrow told uh, uh, Larry King, I'm all ears, Larry. <laughs> all right, guys, if you watch this video to this point, let me know it by saying something unusual in the, the, the notes below. Let's say, say this. Say, Apex, that's very interesting. I have everybody scratch their heads because most people aren't going to watch at this point. And then I'll go look for where's Apex in the video. <laughs> a little dirty trick to pull on, but you know, a lot of people will watch to, you know, the first, you know, 30 seconds of a video and they'll write tons of comments because they know all about it, right? So uh, uh that's a good test. I like to see you, you do that and let me know how you watch. Okay. So the link to the video on surviving EMP is right here. You know, here, here, one or the other. <laughs> you'll see it pop up and my friends thank you very much for watching i hope you'll be safe that video will help you a lot to stay safe in an emp i won't say don't get one of these but just know that there's still risk i can't see how that device absolves you by itself of all your risk if you add the ferret beads you get a little better chance. A little better chance if you can add the ferret beads in there. How well does that protect you? It's, you still don't have facility level protections. You still don't have those. So how does it really protect you and all your devices? You tell me. I'm sure that a lot of people are going to think it does. Okay. Fair. I don't see it. I'm from Missouri. Show me. Thank you for watching. Greg out.